Hello, and welcome to the Natural State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin. It is my belief that the natural state of any living organism is health, and that our artificial habitat has forced us into having artificial health problems. This show is my attempt to dive deep and learn about using nutrition, sleep, movement, relationships, and more to help you reclaim your natural state of health in a modern world and show you how to thrive in an environment that's stacked against you. If you enjoyed today's show, you can find out more details and information at DrAnthonyGustin.com. My guest this week is Dr. Jack Wolfson. Dr. Wolfson was convinced by his wife, chiropractor, he's an MD, to shift his mindset. A long time ago, he was a traditional MD where he was prescribing a lot of medications and not spending a lot of time with his patients to doing more of an integrative approach and working a lot more with nutrition and lifestyle to fix his patients' problems or her problems, and he has seen a tremendous success. So we chat a lot today about his philosophy on how to keep your heart healthy and how to avoid medication, especially when going to see your doctor. So a lot of practical advice in this episode for people. I mean, everyone at this point probably had know somebody who has some sort of heart condition and wants to avoid it themselves. So tune in and I hope you enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Neurohacker Collective. I've been using their products on and off for the last few years and have always been a huge fan of how they formulate their products, their dosing, and they just don't mess around. So Dr. Greg Kelly, their lead product formula is actually on the podcast previously if you want to check that episode out. But you can trust that Neurohacker Collective is always doing 100% dosing backed up by research. A lot of other companies, what they do is they sprinkle in amounts of ingredients so that way you're not actually getting the full amount that is required to have a physiological effect. You just get a little sprinkling and dosing in there. Um, their products are so expected that Dr. Kelly actually recommends taking two days up a week and their serving size is seven really huge capsules, which just shows how much active ingredient they actually put in their product. I am personally a huge fan of their caffeine-free version of their product, Qualia Mind. And I take it on an empty stomach with exogenous ketones in the morning when I know that I really want to get a bunch of uninterrupted deep work hours done. I feel in the zone for literally hours. And the best part is there's no crazy crash afterwards. If you're not a nootropic person, they also have an amazing product called Eternus that contains all the precursors to NAD, which is far more effective than taking direct NAD supplements to reduce oxidative damage to your cells. Again, love the formulation and how they went about making this product. If you want to try out any Neurohacker Collective products, just head to neurohacker.com and use the code AG15 for 15% off all of their products. That's N-E-U-R-O hacker.com and code A-G-1-5 for 15% off all of their products. This episode is brought to you by Paleo Valley. I've been a huge fan of this company for years, ever since I met the founders at a conference, I'd say four years ago plus, and have been eating their 100% grass-fed, grass-finished beef sticks ever since then. The biggest reason though recently why I asked them to come on the show as a sponsor is that they do a lot of support in regenerative farming. They actually continue to reinvest into helping small farmers scale and really building out an amazing sort of supply chain to help regenerative agriculture scale. Not only that, their beef sticks aren't dry as a bone and leave that weird Slim Jim style waxy coating in your mouth. They are plump and juicy and not in a weird way. We gobble these guys up at the perfect keto offices when we don't have time to get a full meal in and they're the perfect real food snack. If you're looking for one of the best beef sticks around that are not only great tasting, but responsibly sourced, check out Paleo Valley. And the great news is listeners of this podcast get 15% off. So just go to paleovalley.com slash AG15 or use code AG15 at checkout at paleovalley.com for 15% off. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com slash AG15. Doc, thanks for coming on the show today. Uh, thank you so much, doctor. I really appreciate uh, having you on. Big fan of your work and, uh, and excited to share a lot of the stuff I'm doing with your audience. Yeah, likewise. I've been following your stuff for a while. I think the first time I saw your your stuff was actually um, at Paleo Effects a couple years ago. Yeah, Paleo Effects was definitely uh, an interesting event. Uh, a lot of good people over there, and uh, you know, for you know, for anyone who's, who's never been, again, it's kind of like finding your own tribe, and uh, you know, getting some good food and working out a little bit, and getting you know, some excellent lectures from some very, uh, you know, very entertaining you know speakers, and and really kind of supporting all the stuff that we do. Whether you know we're talking about paleo or keto or carnivore, uh, I, I I think the one thing that kind of separates me maybe from a, a 
some of the people that I met there is that, you know, we're just hardcore about organic, free range, grass fed, wild seafood. So it's like, you know, we want you to eat this way, but we also want you to eat the best of the best. This is not like Jack Wolfson saying, hey, go to Burger King, get a double whop or hold the bun. You know, we want to make sure we do it the right way. Totally. I mean, have you got any pushback on that type of stuff? There's some times where I promote that very similarly and I just get this whole, you're being an elitist freak and like people can't afford that and it's not sustainable for all Americans. I mean, what is your sort of slant to that? Yeah, my slant is, I mean, it is the only thing that's sustainable. I mean, the the way that corporate farming happens and, and large ranches operates, that is not sustainable because that is just destroying the environment. You have to do it through regenerative, you know, farming and grazing practices. So I think books by, you know, like Joel's, you know, Salatin um, and and things that, that really identify the best way to do it is really the only way. And that is the healthiest for us too. I mean, when we test people's levels of pesticides and chemical exposure, they're sky high if they don't, if they don't, eat things the right way. So does it cost more for organic food? Does it cost more for free range grass fed? Yeah. And and it should. And, you know, Anthony, I would challenge all those people and say, Hey, I I can probably find some other areas of your life where we can cut from the budget. Don't cut from the health food budget. It's better for us uh, to eat that way and live that way. And it's, and it's, again, it's the only way the planet's going to survive is by, is by doing things the way we've always done it as hunter gatherers and you know bringing that into 21st century uh, world. Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the things that I think about often is just that how hard it is to even have access to this stuff right now and just how all nutritious food used to be free and abundant in the past. And now, I mean, even going to small towns, it's like the availability for real food is actually pretty challenging. I think we have a lot of work to do regarding supply chain and distribution and getting to that point. We were chatting a little bit before we started recording about how you split your time between Scottsdale and a small town in Colorado. And I was just wondering in Colorado, sort of a small area, do you have easy access to, to food? Cause I mean, even in Austin where I'm at, it's like there's not that many sources to, to buy truly good quality food. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the other thing, too, is that the more that we support this, the more that we put our money and direct our resources into these type of farms, well, more people are going to do it. Uh, It's just it's just a great business model. You know, kind of one of the things I've talked about most recently is that you have all these people, millions of people, literally millions that work for the, the health and human services department on a federal level and then the state departments of health and the county departments of health and school board, you know, uh, uh, health, if we were to get rid of a lot of those people, because their jobs are totally unnecessary, get rid of those people and redirect them into organic farming into into pasture raised, you know, um, uh, practices, it sounds like a pipe dream. But you know what, let's put all the you know, really the, the resources over there, prices will come down. It's better for our health. It's better for the planet. But, you know, I think, you know, listen, to answer your question, up in the small town right in, in Colorado, there there is a place up there that, again, I mean, there's a lot of places that do, you know, free range grass fed, that do uh, you know, they do grow uh, during, the in, during the cold seasons that they're able to grow indoor um you know, in greenhouses and, and we support those people. And again, I, I'm not interested in new cars or new, new housing or new clothing for myself. I'm not interested in travel. I mean, I love doing all that stuff. Believe me, I do. But the first thing is you got to take care of yourself with the food. And especially if you've got young ones at home, anyone you're concerned with, with health and wellness, you got to put your money over there. You know, Scottsdale is, is, is okay for food. I think California is pretty pretty ahead of the trend when it comes to healthy food. California, of course, has their own problems. But Colorado, and I think over the years, once again, farmers markets, we love going to farmers markets. Arizona's got some great farmers markets for nine months out of the year. The growing season here, I mean, obviously, they've got a ton of sunshine. Uh, you know, the, the issue down here is water and summertime, too much heat, but the growing season is nine months. It's, it's really spectacular. Right. So, I mean, you weren't always like this with this mindset 
you know, like, so I, I'm curious as far as your path towards where you're at right now, everybody has their own journey and it's never ending, but how did you sort of want to get involved in all this stuff from, I guess, just your degree from the get-go all the way to how it's developed over time? Yeah, you know, I, I'm a I'm a cardiologist like my father before me. I grew up and was and was fully trained in Chicago, and four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine, three years of cardiology training, and you know, coming out of Chicago, deep dish pizza, Italian beef sandwiches, hot dogs, no interest whatsoever in the quality of food. Of course, as a medical doctor, we we don't get any training whatsoever in nutrition. We don't get any training in holistic wellness by any means. It's all about pharmaceuticals. It's all about procedures like pacemakers and angiograms and stents and all this other stuff that we do in the hospital. We don't get any of that. So everything I learned really came after meeting my wife in, in 2005. She is a doctor of chiropractic DC, uh, as she says, DC doctor of cause. And when we first got together, she started telling me all this stuff. She's like, your profession is a sham. You're killing people. You're not helping people. Uh, you got to come up with a, with, with a new, with a new paradigm and stuff like that. And yeah, right. I mean, I've said, you've heard, me, you've heard me say that it's all, it was all on the first date. And again, I, I totally listened to what she had to say because I saw all the sickness around me. I saw the sickness in my family, saw the sickness in my father uh, who was dying of, of a Parkinson's like illness. And I saw all of this and it just, it just made sense. It totally clicked. Now uh, my wife is a total, Total powerhouse. She's absolutely beautiful. So it was this beautiful message and a beautiful package from this beautiful human being. And again, I started to change, but you know, you get a lot of blowback from the medical system. My partners at the time, they didn't want to believe it. They don't want to believe it because again, it rocks the foundation of everything we've ever been taught. And it also can rock the, the financial uh, aspect of it. Like, you know, we are so dependent on seeing a lot of people doing all these different procedures. That's how the cardiologists make their money. So to get people to understand that was very difficult uh, and in fact, impossible. There's very few holistic cardiologists like me that practice this way, but um, that's okay. We'll keep fighting to, to get the truth out to the public. We're going to get people away from the conventional cardiologists. We're going to get them into real health and prevention from doctors like myself and doctors like yourself. And that's how the, you know, the truth is going to win the day. Yeah. So what were the, some of the biggest changes you made when you were first confronted with paradigm shift that you had? Well, I think the easiest thing really is to, is to, is to go organic. Like, you know, if you want organic ice cream, you know, if you want to eat ice cream, go organic. If you want coffee, go organic. Uh, you know, those things are real simple. Now, if we, you know, you and I talk to people about, Hey, you know what? I want you to go sugar free, or I want you to go strict keto or carnivore or strict paleo. Those things can be difficult, but if we can just get everybody on the organic bandwagon. And again, I do urine environmental toxin testing on all of my patients where we check for 27 different environmental toxins, including glyphosate and atrazine and parabens and phthalates and plastics. And so many people light up on those tests. And clearly we can show that those things are causative of cardiovascular illness. So therefore, what do we need to do? Well, we need to do the best that we can. And the best that we can clearly includes organic, but I think that's pretty simple. And then let me tell you this too, Doc, is that, you know, we can all debate about how, or, you know, and complain about, oh, I can't afford this, this, and this. And believe me, you can when we cut out all the other fluff. But you know, sunshine is 100% free. Uh, daylight is 100% free. Going to sleep at the right time is also a free proposition. So it's kind of like the time of hashtag no excuses. Right. And let's get on with this and let's take our health back. Yeah. So, I mean, you talk about like all of these things that you test for in the urine. I mean, there's not a lot of, I guess, in, in, in your profession, I think that there's some other doctors who are hip to this stuff, but the, the connection, like you said, that you think is clear between some of these environmental toxins and heart disease. So I'd love for you to break that down a little bit and sort of your opinion on some of these things, like, like you mentioned. 
Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, I mean, listen, it's no it's no fault of the cardiologist per se. It's just they're brainwashed into that system, into that paradigm. These are these are smart people that we're dealing with. I mean, obviously, I mean, these are the people that, you know, whatever, they were at the top of their undergraduate class and then they went on to medical school and they became this, this and this. But again, it's just it's just what you've been taught in your system. So if you never were taught as a cardiologist that plastic is linked to cardiovascular disease. And if we test people's levels of bisphenol A, that bisphenol A in the literature that's produced shows that it causes cardiovascular disease. Or if you look at things that, you know, like glyphosate, that is the main ingredient in the herbicide Roundup. If you don't understand all of the connection about how glyphosate destroys glutathione, which is the body's main antioxidant. So now you have in inflammation, oxidative stress, and then you have disease. If you don't understand the cause of inflammation, you're not going to be able to fix it. So the cardiologists understand that inflammation is bad. They just don't know and they're not interested in the cause of that. Now they're interested in putting you on aspirin. They're interested in putting you on statin drugs and other pharmaceutical anti-inflammatories because that's all that they've been taught. So you know, when I talk about, you know, chapter, you know, uh, you know, chapters of my book and the chapters of my book where I show you that here, here's the data of how the pesticides, of how the herbicides, of how the plastics and the parabens and the phthalates, how all of those interfere with cardiovascular function. And I put all the data right there into my book. It's just, again, the cardiologist, um, it's not that they don't care. Um, again, it's just not in their their business model, and it's uh, it's sad. It's a real it's a real sad state of affairs because millions of people suffer, uh, you know, the consequences from it. And I'm very interested, of course, for my patients, but I'm interested in myself personally for not dying like my father did at 63. So, how did your clinic with armed with all this information? How did your clinic and how you saw patients and your patient visits and your treatment plans get altered once you started changing this way? Yeah, no, obviously. I mean, so, you know, if you're a conventional cardiologist, you have 10 minute office visits and and that, and frankly, you know, that's fine because all you need is the 10 minute office visit because you've really got nothing to say except for here's the pills, sign up for your procedure and go on your way. There's nothing, you know, otherwise part of that 10 minutes could be talking about, well, you know, where was your latest trip or, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, what's the latest book that you read? Uh, you know, there's nothing else really that they have to educate on. You're right. When, when people come to see docs like us, you know, we, we got a lot to say. So my initial consultation is 90 minutes. I also do 45 minutes, uh, you know, by phone uh, or, or Zoom communication somewhere where we can record that message as well so we can work virtually. Now more than ever, I think it's important to be able to work virtually to be able to help people from all around the world. But it takes a lot of time, right? It takes a lot of time to talk about these things. Uh, but even in that 90 minute initial intake, there's still so much more that we need to work people with. And that's where, you know, blog posts or the book comes in or online courses and webinars that I've done are helpful. I also have a team of health coaches around me that really help to support um, you know what we're doing. Uh, I work with a lot of doctors uh, locally, nationally, internationally. So you know for example, chapter 14 of my book is called The Wonders of Chiropractic Care. It's an eight page um, uh, you know it, it's eight pages where I talk about how chiropractic helps my cardiovascular patients, what chiropractic is, uh, and some of the data supporting that, some testimonials regarding that. And again, why all of my patients have to be under the care of a doctor of chiropractic. And I think, you know, really once we start to get people to understand this whole, this team approach and how it takes a lot of different things, it's not about, t you know, taking a statin drug to lower heart attack risk from five to 4%. It's about how do we achieve 0% and we don't die like my father and millions of other fathers and mothers that just died way too soon. Right. Yeah. I mean, so like as, as far as medications go, I mean, do you think that there's any place for statins or any of the other common medications that maybe you used to prescribe or your former colleagues prescribed? I, I personally don't. I don't think there's any any need for statin drugs at all, because I think in a lot of ways that what the cardiologists tell people is, hey, don't worry about your diet. Don't worry about your lifestyle. Just take your Lipitor and you're good to go. Well, that kind of behavior has led 
honestly to millions of people dying way too soon. So that's why I've written blog posts like "Statin Drugs Kill People," uh, not because you know, not because the you know the data shows that, because the data again shows that statin drugs in certain groups of people can save lives. Uh, but again, it's a small amount of lives. But what it's done is that it leads people to unhealthy behaviors. Whereas, again, it's not about 5% versus 4% chance of dying. It's about how do we make you 0% chance of dying until you're 125. That's what the goal is. But I will tell you that um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's no role for aspirin. Blood pressure drugs may be a different story. But the idea with blood pressure drugs always has to be is that let's keep working together to get you off of the blood pressure drugs. So I do still prescribe blood pressure drugs. I still do prescribe some pharmaceuticals for atrial fibrillation, but the understood goal between my patients and I is always that we're working together to get off the pharmaceuticals. That has to be what the plan is. Yeah. I mean, what are the, some of the main ones that people are on that are easier than others to, to sort of wean them off of? Well, you know, and, and once again, you know, going back to this, statin drugs. I quickly stop uh, statin drugs on people. You know, so, so for example, I've got a, I've got a website, if I can mention, you know, the doctorswolfson.com forward slash cholesterol. And that takes you to a video that I did on cholesterol. So in that video, we talk about what cholesterol is, why it's so important. We talk about the fallacy and the failures of the pharmaceuticals. And then we talk about how to find your your perfect cholesterol through nutrition and sunshine and sleep and chiropractic care, and then evidence-based supplements on how supplements can help dial in the perfect number for each one of us. And everything is fully referenced. All the resources are in there. So that's kind of the cholesterol. I also have the doctorswolfson.com forward slash hypertension, again, about what blood pressure is, the failures of the pharmaceuticals, and then how we can use natural lifestyle to improve blood pressure. For example, I talk in there about how chiropractic care reduces blood pressure by 17 on the top to 10 over the bottom, 17 over 10. That's as good or better than any pharmaceutical uh, without the side effects and actually goes after causation by balancing the autonomic nervous system. So by doing all of that, that's how we get people off of blood pressure pharmaceuticals. Uh, we talk about natural blood thinners. Uh, again, we talk again about finding the cause of people's cardiovascular issues and we achieve tremendous success in doing so. And it's really exciting because again, people, you know, they're not hearing this anywhere else. So uh, I'm all about toppling the medical system. Uh, you know, there's a time and a place for emergency care. I get it. Listen, you know, if you're, if you're in the midst of a heart attack, go to the emergency room. But I got to tell you, if someone said, hey, should I, you know, in the midst of a heart attack, should I stop by and get a chiropractic adjustment before I go? Um, I, I think it's an interesting proposition. Or let me ask you this, Anthony, what do you think about how if we had a DC in in the major emergency rooms where a heart attack victim's coming in, what if the chiropractor adjusted that person before they went on for all their fancy medical procedures? I got to tell you, I think if we studied it, I think outcomes would definitely be better in the chiropractic group. Yeah, I mean, not only that, but it's like you, you sort of look at these things from a risk reward perspective. And I think that even if there is a marginal improvement in reward here and upside due to literally zero risk, why wouldn't you start to look at some of these things? And I don't think we we do that looking backwards the other way. Like we don't look at medications as this risk reward thing. Okay, yeah, reward, maybe you get some of these. LDL particles cleared out, you're not dealing with inflammation and people aren't going to change their lifestyle, but the risk of all these downstream effects is so grand. And so I think that we should be looking at our treatment protocols more so from that standpoint. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. I mean, but you know, and like I said, it's just, you know, when, when we give people the, op if we don't talk to them about real health and wellness, and we just quickly give them the pharmaceutical, again, we're just exactly. missing that opportunity of why we became doctors. You know, we, be we became doctors to help people, not to be pharmaceutical sales reps, you know, to, to distribute the pharmaceuticals. And it's just, uh, it's just so sad 
again, for these doctors who don't know that there's a better way than what they're doing. It's just there's such brainwashed monkeys, you know, into this paradigm. And it's just uh, it's horrible. And, and I'm all about getting people out of it. But I mean, listen, there's other cardiologists do, that do what I do. There's not many of us. And again, it's just like when your job depends on you not understanding something, which is a famous quote from Austin, um, uh, from Upton Sinclair from his early 1900s book, The Jungle. It's hard to get a man to understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. So if we don't wake up, you know, these these medical doctors and change the whole system, uh, you know, society suffers. But that's why I push everybody to holistic doctors, whether it's naturopaths or chiropractors you know, or homeopaths, you know, these these. These industries were crippled by the Flexner Report and the Rockefeller Foundation in the early 1900s into, you know, again, where they just kind of wiped out all natural uh, uh, doctors in, in, uh, in favor of the pharmaceutical industry. And, and American health has suffered for over 100 years because of it. Right. And so obviously every patient encounter is different and everyone's a unique presentation. But do you guys have a sort of a framework of how you peel back and prioritize you know, whether it's nutrition, movement, sleep, stress, environmental exposure to toxins, et cetera. Well, you know, it's, um, it, it is, it can be difficult to unpack. And I often say this too, Anthony, is that, you know, it's very easy to be a conventional coach cardiologist. Someone's blood pressure is high. Here's your pills. Cholesterol is abnormal. Here's your pills. Heart attack recovery. Here's your pills. AFib. Here's your pills. And that that actually is very easy because the, the options are relatively few. Now you get into the causation area where you're talking about nutrition. You're talking about lifestyle. You're talking about the most advanced testing in the world. You're talking about evidence-based supplements. You're talking about uh, uh, physical activity and you're talking about uh, uh, chiropractic care, osteopathic manipulation, and that gets to be very difficult. So I recently, uh, as of last night, I did an online course where it was a seven-part series that we did over the course of two weeks, seven parts, about 10 hours of information regarding atrial fibrillation, which is a major pain point for millions of Americans and tens of millions around the world. And even after the 10 hours, I feel like I just kind of vomited out 10 hours of information and I left people with still a sense of like, wow, what just happened? So even then we need to help, you know, guide people along. And that's where I think the health coaches come in, or maybe it's a nutritionist or other kind of people that continue the dialogue, continue the conversation, continue to guide people on that path to health and wellness. So I think that's really been something that's uh, th that I've had to learn over the years is that um, most people, when their profession is not holistic health, and even if it is, they need a lot of guidance with it. And I think that, you know, podcasts like yours, the information that you give, you know, you listen to this, hopefully you can find time to listen to this once or listen to it twice and continue to learn and educate yourself. And that's how we're going to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think about this question a lot and just the healthcare system, the food system, how, how screwed up there. And like, I just thinking, you know, like where are the levers we can put in and, and sort of topple this thing over. And I don't necessarily think it needs to be retraining all doctors. And I think that you make a good point. And uh, Chris Kresser is doing a really good job doing this, but training more health coaches, nutritionists, and sort of mobilizing this entire army instead of thinking and having people have the assumption that, Oh, only a, a, an MD can help me with any health problem that I have and sort of creating this more holistic community around this type of education, I think it has to be a center, uh, centerpiece to it. Yeah, I, you know, I, it, unfortunately, it's really slow moving in the medical community. It is going to come from people that really live and breathe the holistic uh, wellness lifestyle. So whether it's Chris Presser's program uh, or others like it, I recently developed something called the Cardiovascular Health Institute, where I'm looking to train people in in holistic and integrative cardiology. So really kind of getting that focus, which of course affects, uh, you know, 
a hundred million Americans, you know, let alone people around the world. So to use my teachings and my platform to be able to educate, whether it's, it's health coaches looking for for, uh, further training, it's naturopaths, it's chiropractors, or even MDs and DOs, nutritionists as well, that want to learn about cardiovascular health and wellness. And then also giving them the the business ability to okay now you've learned all this stuff personally how can you therefore educate other people and then also make this into a business opportunity for these people again to uh you know to multiply our message and take this to the world how can the health coach take the message of health or you know of integrative cardiology take that to the world and that's where it's like okay I, I build the powerpoint presentations i've got all the information i've got all the research i've got all the data on there and then now how do you take that to to your public and to your areas and then also what you can do with this anthony of course is hey invite the mds into your lecture so they can see what you're doing. So maybe we can all work together on this. And, you know, 10 years down the road, we truly have changed the face of healthcare. Yeah, totally. And um, I mean, this is sort of something to see that until we start doing this, like we're, we're not going to learn all the variability. I think we're still pretty early on as far as, you know, we have all of these principles, you know, these paleo type principles, et cetera that are very helpful when creating paradigms, but we still have a lot to learn regarding, okay, when somebody gets off of this track and they, they are messing up their bodies, like how do we get them back to baseline as a human and how that should be? And I think that we need to learn more and I think we need to focus on that and collecting more information. And I think to do that, we need to have more people trained and just create a better feedback loop system. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And, uh, and I mean, but I think it's happening, you know, once again, there's, you know, there's all these different programs that are springing up. Um, so, you know, certainly, uh, you know, naturopathic colleges, chiropractic colleges, really, really super, super exciting on where it's going. And I think there's so many young people that are just interested in that, you know, and I think a lot of people, obviously, you know, they saw their parents and they saw the sickness, they saw the pharmaceuticals, they saw, you know, running back and forth to the doctor. People don't want that anymore. They just, uh, you know, again, they just want better, you know, for health and wellness. And I think, you know, again, as you get healthy, it just leads to healthier relationships. It leads to, uh, uh, you know, again, just a healthier career. I mean, you know, when you're healthier, when your mind is clear, when your body is clear, uh, you become a better worker. You're more productive in, in, in all facets of, of life. And I love to focus on that as well. Right. And then, I mean, as far as how you think about nutrition and, and how it relates to people's cardiovascular health, I mean, I'm sure we could dive in a lot here. It's become, it's become rather in vogue over the last few years to apply this generalized, extremely low carb approach to everybody and I'm just curious as far as like how you think that, it, you know, obviously there's bio-individuality here, but h how do you sort of think about carbohydrate tolerance and how it contributes to cardiovascular health? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I love to talk about diet and stuff like that. And, and I will, I, I, I'd love to, you know, continue to talk to you about that. But certainly, I guess there's so much debate out there about different diets and different, you know, and different ways to approach it. But is diet any more important than sleep? No way. And the literature supports that. Is diet more important than getting sunshine? I don't think so. Is diet any more important than stress management, especially right now when stress and fear and anxiety are, they have to be at an all time high. So is mental health and wellness is, is it more important than nutrition, physical activity? Where does that relate versus nutrition? So it's like we all like to debate about what the best nutrition is. Right. And I think we need to really continue to focus on those other areas. Getting back to nutrition, I think, again, the most important thing is getting the chemicals out of your food. So no matter what your food is, get the chemicals out, stick with organic, and let's talk about that as a good start. And then from there, I'm a big fan of gluten free. I think the evidence is really becoming more prevalent about the damage of what gluten does. So let's get the gluten out. And then to finally answer your question, I mean, again, I'm the paleocardiologist. My book is called The Paleocardiologist. I think that hunter-gatherer foods are clearly the best foods. Now, can some of that swing between 
uh, extremely low carb or can we add back in some of the higher carb things like uh, potatoes, for example, or maybe, you know, where does wild rice fit into that picture? Where does quinoa uh, and some of those other non-gluten free uh, or non-gluten containing grains fit into it or some of the more starchy carbs or where does fruit fit into that mix? And I'm, and I'm definitely into some amount of seasonal fruit. So I, I guess I would ultimately say that I'm cool with kind of going back and forth between low carb and higher carb paleo, uh, m- maybe between seasons as well. So maybe kind of like in the winter season, it's more of a low carb paleo. In the summertime, you, you swing towards the higher carb paleo I also love the idea of going carnivore and carnivore challenge. So we've done these carnivore challenges with our people where we just do it for seven days. And how crazy is it, right, Anthony, where people, people, you know, cardiologists is talking about only eating meat and seafood and eggs, where other cardiologists, again, they'll, they'll want to strip my license. They'll complain to the medical board saying Wolfson is talking this crazy talk. Yet carnivore approach, I think, again, is, is good for a cleanse. I know people have done it for long periods of time. Uh, for me personally, I think, it's, I think it's a good challenge. I think whether you do a seven-day or 30-day, to me, challenges break addictions and to get people off of sugar and alcohol and other kinds of uh, you know, unhealthy foods during the carnivore challenge, I think is awesome. And I think, you know, once again, the literature is is starting to really support that. And you know this as well as I do, that the data, you know, on low carb, the data on, on keto, the data on paleo, I just wrote a book chapter for uh, Mark Houston, medical doctor at Vanderbilt University for his textbook on integrative uh, nutrition. I wrote the chapter on paleo nutrition and heart health. I have over a hundred references in that chapter, you know, so how, how are you going to argue with that? But don't argue with common sense either. You know, it's just what we've been doing for millions of years, right? Yeah. And I think that another big thing about just going to a carnivore based diet for a little bit of time, I think that you, you've made some really good points about getting some breaks from some certain food, but I think that just the mental and emotional learnings that happen and seeing your relationship to food and how much people generally go towards food as a pleasure or distraction system to cover up a lot of these mental health problems is something that, you know, I've seen a lot for in myself in the past, uh, let alone with tons of people that I've worked with. Yeah. And I think alcohol is a big factor in that too, you know, where people are like, oh, you know, I have a glass of two, you know, glass or two of wine at the end of the day to unwind. And it's like, well, then I think you got to start looking at why, why do you need to unwind and, and what are you using, you know, to, to help you unwind? I think, you know, my, my best advice on alcohol is one to two drinks per week is pretty much the maximum of, of how I see it. Uh, you know, you know, drinking organic alcohol, I think is the way to go, but you're right. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, when you, when you, when you go carnivore like that, you realize you're getting every single nutrient that your body needs. If you're eating a whole sardine or a whole anchovy, like the whole fish, you have everything that you need to live. When you eat eggs, you know, an egg is a cocoon for a baby chicken. It contains all the nutrients for a chicken to co- come to life. There's nothing more healthy than that. There's no broccoli or kale or cabbage or sprouts or anything that's going to compare to the nutritional value of free-range grass-fed liver or a whole seafood or eating oysters or shrimp you know, or eating these eggs. You can't compare to it. Uh, and you're right. It's just, it breaks down the food addictions. And then the final let me say this. You talk about how, how can you afford to live this way? Well, a pound of free range grass fed liver is around $4. And that's at places like Whole Foods. You may be able to get it at farmer's markets, you know, for even cheaper than that. So free range grass fed liver, even if you had to pay $10 a pound, a pound of liver would, you could live on that for, you know, for two to three days. So when you do this carnivore challenge, the cost actually of eating food, it dramatically drops because the foods are so calorie dense. If you eat a can of sardines, that is extremely filling, extremely satiating. 
doesn't hit your carb cravings and your carb and sugar addictions. But again, you can live on cans of sardines for, you know, for a week or two or even a month. And a can of sardines can cost you two and a half bucks. Who can't afford two and a half bucks or even with the best eggs in the world? What, what if you find the best eggs in the world and they're $8 a dozen? Well, you know, if you, if you eat a, you know, a six egg omelet, uh, that's $4. Right. And, and that's and that's a very filling meal. Most people spend, uh, you know, fifteen dollars at Starbucks in the morning. Yeah. I mean, the the amount of nutrition that you can get for a low cost is is amazing. I think you make a, a lot of good points here regarding sleeps free. All this stuff is you know cheaper than you may think. And, you know, a lot of stuff you've seen before as well about movement and mental health being huge pillars of health that can't go ignored, I mean, are, are also pretty abundant and free as well. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, the, you know, chapter five of my book is called the, um, uh, you know, one nation under Prozac. And, uh, the whole idea of that obviously is that the answer to your health, uh, and, uh, you know, mental health issues certainly is not Prozac. It's a, you know, um, it, it's, it's, going after the cause and trying to fix the cause as best as possible. And uh, I want people to understand that stress, anxiety, depression in the literature markedly increases cardiovascular risk. You know, what's going on right now with, uh, with massive unemployment, people that are unemployed, I guess, understandably, I mean, it makes sense on these, on these numbers and it's, it's horrific to think about, but unemployed people have a 500% higher risk of committing suicide. Again, it's, it's horribly unfortunate, but it does make sense that an unemployed person is like more likely to kill themselves than someone who has a job. But if you're unemployed, you have a 280% higher risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. So, you know these these mental factors are are, are massive. Um, social isolation, being alone in this world, uh, markedly increases your risk of cardiovascular death as well. So as people feel more isolated than ever, and a lot of older people are now staying at home and they're afraid to go out into the world we're going to see catastrophic ramifications. I think you'll agree when we go back and look at the data, you know, and this is all studied three to five years from now, we're going to see just absolutely alarming uh, rates of heart attacks, of strokes, of atrial fibrillation, and certainly of suicides, you know, from, from what's happening right now. And this is more important than ever to really work on mental health and, and, and wellness. And again, you know, um, uh, you know, finding finding a good career for yourself, changing careers. If I could change careers, anybody can. You know, if I can make that pivot, anybody can. Um, you know, family members that are in your life and maybe don't understand, you know, your way of life or just represent problems for you. Well, it's time to distance, you know, those those family and friends and find new family and friends, right. uh, you know, to associate with people that are in your tribe. Uh, you know, again, it's just more important than ever to, to work to get that good quality message mental health. Yeah. And I think that, you know, like you said, we're going to look back at this time regarding all this lockdown, these 38 million uh, unemployed people, or if it's more or less right now, it's, it's somewhere around there. And, um, you know, sort of ask ourselves, was this the right approach? Uh, I think that a lot of people are holding out for hope on a, a vaccine that will magically fix everything. And I know you've done a lot of work here before. So just curious in your thoughts about people's, you know, holding out for the vaccines to save us from, from, um, this pandemic. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to be a cataclysmic, uh, you know, failure on, on, on many, many, many levels. You know, to me, the answer is never with an injection. It's never with a pharmaceutical, you know, the answer again is to build up the human body to, you know, we, we are, we are built to withstand, uh, viruses, bacteria, fungus. We, we, we live with those. We've got hundreds of trillions of viral particles in each and every one of our bodies that is well documented. So we want to live in symbiosis and in harmony with those and we're not going to defeat it with any kind of uh, uh, injection. So, you know, in, in, in this time frame, you know, what's happening right now, personally, my opinion would have been whatever this is, 
uh, you know, this virus that's coming through, let it affect, uh, let it affect and infect everybody. Now we have true herd Im- immunity. You never shut down the economy. The people that are dying are the people with extreme comorbidities. Again, let it go through society, like whether it's influenza or it's chicken pox or it's measles, let everybody get it and let's move on. And now society is stronger. Instead, what's happened is you made society monumentally weaker. Everybody is weaker now. Now, everybody is trying to sterilize their environment. That is a horrible, horrible way to live. It destroys the immune system in doing so. And then if you think you're waiting for a vaccine to come out in three months or six months, uh, by definition, it will be untested. By right. definition, right? right? It will be untested. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, I think we're subjecting ourselves to a lot of long-term uh, research studies where nobody, there's there's no one who's actually the researcher, and we're just all unwittingly saying, okay, well, let's let's see what's going on here, um, and I think that this is going to be no different. And yeah, it's 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 bizarre to see the reaction. I think people get a little tunnel vision when they they have this emotional fear that these invisible monsters are you know going to come out and attack and kill everybody and I have no control. So let's stop everything at, at once. And, and I think people just forget that that death is a normal part of life. And that and in the recent thing I saw regarding statistics on average age of death of um, a COVID patient was actually slightly higher than the average age of death of all humans from all causes. Right. Right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, yes. I mean, it, you know, people, people, we, you know, People will die. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And and so far in the history of the world, everybody is, you know, uh, it, all humans have died. So um, uh, death is, you know, certainly we want to push it as far as we can into the future. But again, what we're doing is we think that we're we're saving so many people and we're saving the doctors in the emergency rooms and the hospitals, um, you know, and and we're doing so. And the the long term ramifications of that are going to be absolutely horrific. You know, the you know the United Nations has said that when as we go into a global recession, that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of additional children will die because of global recession or how many people are now being abused, children abuse, spousal abuse, because, you know, the husband is out of work or mom and dad are drinking or, or turn into drugs or whatever because of the downturn in the in the economy. And then as far as the vaccine is concerned, again, yeah, they're going to unleash the vaccine in six months. What, what randomized, double blind, placebo controlled long-term trial will have been done. The same things that have never been done where they've looked at long-term randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. The standard of care, the scientific method is totally being abolished um, and it looks like it's going to be mandatory for people to get back out into society. So the um, uh, if we don't rise up as a society uh, and take control, man, it's, um, it's going to be an end game for, for all of us. But I think the truth will prevail. I, I have a lot of confidence in that. Yeah. I and mean, with an infectious disease, of course, you need to, you know, when it, when it first started five, six months ago, you need to be very cautious because you don't know unknown unknowns. And I, I, I understand that. I'm not saying we should needlessly just let people die and not do anything about it. But once this was, once this unfolds, we need to start looking at the data when we get it and we've just not done that and doesn't seem like anybody's interested in doing that moving forward. And I mean, the same is just like of looking at nutrition, unleashing vegetable oil, you know, and having 99.9% of people consume some form of vegetable oil and never having researched, is this okay for human consumption? I mean, I'm sure that given the material you've put out book name, et cetera, that you, you would agree with me that like anything that's, outside or abnormal of a natural human environment is likely not going to be additive to our health, but more subtractive. Yeah, most certainly. I mean, listen, you know, you, um, uh, we're, we're, we think we're trading in this, you know, kind of short term, you know, with people dying and the ramifications for the long term. But if you look at the people that are dying again, yeah, I mean, there's always some horror story about, oh, this guy was totally healthy. He was 45 years old and he died. First of all, you and I, of course, would look at that person if we were able to talk to that person. I'll tell you if they're healthy or not. I'll tell you by asking them questions, you know, about, you know, what they were eating, what they were drinking, how they were sleeping. 
you know, what kind of, you know, uh, health care they were under. Uh, let me look at the most advanced lab testing in the world and see their markers of inflammation and oxidative stress and lipids and vitamin D and omega-3 and intracellular vitamins and minerals and, and testing for leaky gut. Let me do all those things and I will uncover that this person was not healthy. But the vast majority of the people are dying are the elderly that are under the care of medical doctors. They see medical doctors historically. They're on their pharmaceuticals. They've had their treatments. They've had their therapies. And now when a virus comes along, they are subject to dying. So the answer, of course, is not to um, put society under martial law and under quarantine stay-at-home orders. The answer is to get people out of the medical system, make them bulletproof with healthy immunity, and we will defeat this virus, the next virus, any other thing that wants to be trotted out against us, we will defeat it, whether it's 5G, EMF, air pollution, stuff like that. That's how we're going to give our bodies the best chance. Right. Very well said, sir. Uh, Thank well, I mean, thanks for coming on and sharing a lot of this information and your approach. I mean, I think it's very refreshing for people who maybe have gone through the classic medical doctor route and haven't gotten any results that there's people like you, like you out there who are changing their minds. Um, so I appreciate all you're doing. Where can people find your information and everything you're doing? Well, I mean, listen, uh, you know, I'd love to offer anybody a copy of my book for free. You go to freeheartbook.com, uh, freeheartbook.com, and you get a copy of my book. All you do is pay for shipping and handling on that, you know, $4.95 in the United States. You get a free copy of the book, give it to, uh, you know, read it yourself, give it to someone that you love. I, I think that's my my kind of best approach, you know, for everybody right now. But I appreciate, you know, you having me on. Uh, I appreciate everything that you do. Love the information. And uh, yeah, please, uh, please keep changing the world. Appreciate it, Doc. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Natural State Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd really appreciate you heading over to whatever service you're listening to this podcast on, dropping me a five-star review and your thoughts on the show. This helps us get discovered by more people and spreading the good gospel of health. And if you want to stay plugged into all of my self-health experiments, recent research in books that I'm reading and my interpretations of those things, products that I'm testing and thoughts on all things related to health. Check out my free weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can sign up for that at dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. That's dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. Thanks again for tuning in and your support of the Natural State Podcast.